with these videos, we're aiming to create an online library where if you don't manage to come to Full Circle uh, or any of our events that we think are worth putting up, you can come uh, in your own time and look at this video and learn about the topic. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so I'm Gabriel from Daterra. And most of the times that I come to the UK to talk about coffee, we like a lot to talk about the experimentation towards developing new flavors, new taste. And today we have a, a kind of different focus. So Henry asked me to talk a little bit about the soil microbiology research that we have been developing at Daterra. And actually, I think that this is a quite trendy topic because uh, many people before me talked about this. Uh, but also, I think that's becoming trendy because it's something that's so important and maybe not only coffee, but agriculture in general has ignored that topic for so long because we were, were looking too much to what was above soil. And right now, we are seeing that the the way that we can actually uh, keep sustainable and keep producing whatever we are producing is but actually looking what's underneath our feet. So that's why I'm going to share with you a little bit of our research on that. But just to give you a, a quick introduction of what is the Terra for those who are not familiar with our farms. The Terra is a coffee farm in Brazil uh, in the Cerrado region in the Minas Gerais state. Minas Gerais state is the biggest producing state in Brazil and it has three growing regions. One of them is Cerrado. Cerrado actually, it's a very interesting land because if you think about Cerrado, 80 years ago, there was no coffee there. And because we actually started to study agronomy and we started to develop new techniques through science, uh, Agronomists made Cerrado a land that actually could produce a lot of coffee and today is one of the biggest growing regions in the country. Um, so, but what, I, what am I going to say today when it comes to microbiology of the soil? When, when we think about soil microbiology, it's really related to sustainability, to ways that we produce coffee more naturally, in a more environmental friendly way, but also it can be related to the production, it can be related to uh, creating a new agronomy that actually guides us to the future of agriculture. So I like to start this conversation by showing this ladder here. Uh, when we started the Terra, is we started with other products that were not coffee. We, we tried cattle, we tried uh, fruits like lime, and avocado and different things until actually Luis, who was the person that had this idea of creating a agronomical business, uh, he thought, okay, let's try coffee because coffee seemed to be one of the products that he could balance a production of agribusiness, uh, agribusiness that would produce something, and at the same time he would be fully sustainable. And this word sustainability didn't even exist when he started. This was uh, a little bit above 30 years ago. And at the time, we didn't know how to produce coffee because Luis and the, the Pascual family, they didn't have any tradition in agriculture. Actually, they have other businesses in Brazil uh, and the biggest business that they have actually fixes cars and changes tires. There's nothing to do with coffee. But he had this dream of having a business that could be more environmentally friendly, and agriculture was that, and coffee. So at the time, there was no certification for coffee. So I mean, there were a few, but not really for coffee. They were for, for environmentally friendly uh, techniques. And what we had to do at the Terra, because we were born not to be a coffee farm, but we were born to be a agribusiness that could actually give back to the planet, Luis and Leo, uh, who was our general manager at the time, they sat down together and they wrote their own certification. So this is actually a letter that was written in 94 when uh, they were discussing what would be the standards 
for that they're actually keep producing coffee for the next years. So this was 94, and no coffee certifications were available at the time. This was what actually guided them for many, many years until in 2003, we were the first Rainforest Alliance certified farm in Brazil. Uh, and we are very proud of that because for us it was very clear that we should be doing those things. And actually, recently we discovered this ladder that we didn't even know that existed, but this really shows that taking care of the planet was something that the Terra was born up on that base. Um, so our dream was not only producing coffee, but producing coffee for a better world. And how to do that? We had to come up with very creative techniques to, to produce coffee in a country that was not really respected for, by many factors. First of all, Brazil was always considered a, a country that was producing high, high volumes with very low quality. Second of all, um, in terms of the government f fiscalizing what people were doing, we were not very good at that at the time, and today maybe improved a little bit, but still, uh, it's something that we are not very, very good at. And also, in terms of environmental techniques, Brazil had this tradition of producing as much as possible and giving back as little as possible. So how could we create our, our own strategies? To create the Terra, we invited a university that came to the farm, and they were agri uh, agronomy students that were starting to study how to do more natural techniques for growing coffee, growing different agri products, and they used the Terra as their lab. So they were, they were experimenting inside the farm, different techniques to, to create a balanced environment for the Brazilian reality. So we have to remember that Brazil has some very specific ways to grow coffee that are different from other places. So we cannot compare Brazil to Honduras or to Colombia or Costa Rica. Uh, each place has its own way to be in balance and to produce something at the same time. So all of this was considered from the very beginning. And after much, much work, uh, and we were very proud to be recognized three years ago as the most sustainable farm of the country. So the biggest um, media uh, communications channel in Brazil, they were looking at all agricultural farms, all, all everything. They were growing coffee and beans and cattle. So they were trying to find what was which was the most sustainable farm in the country because everyone was talking about sustainability. So what did that mean? And they chose the Terra among all the products and among all the farms. We celebrated because this was a big achievement after 30 years trying to be sustainable. Uh, but we celebrated for very short because at the same time there was a big problem and a challenge for us. For example, when uh, an athlete uh, goes to the Olympics, they, of course, always want a gold medal. So if this athlete goes there and he gets the third place, next time he goes to the Olympics, he's going to try harder, and maybe he gets the silver, and maybe the, thir the third time he goes there, he gets the gold, and what he does next? He gets the silver. He retires. <laughs> he retires. So achieving the first place could be a problem for us. Because we were born trying to be sustainable, trying to give back to the planet. And then, after 30 years, we, are, we achieved this recognition that actually we're the most sustainable farm of the country. So this can be a very good recognition, but at the same time, it can make you just accommodate. And if you think that you are in the top, you can just retire. And if you retire, you are not doing your job anymore. Uh, so, Luis, He's a very unquiet person. <laughs> he, <laughs> let's put it like that. He started to think, okay, how can we create the new chapter of sustainability of the Terra? We have already developed some water recycling systems. We have already developed wildlife corridors. We have already tracked the whole fauna and flora of the farm. We, had, we have a foundation. We take care of the community. We teach women how to drive tractors so they increase their their pay and they help their families. Okay, but what can we do that can be a big statement for the whole coffee industry and actually help other people to produce coffee for the next 50 years or even more? So 
that was, that was when the Bioterra Academy was born. What is the Bioterra Academy? It's a think tank where we try to find new solutions, more natural solutions to grow coffee, and in a more sustainable way, although I think that sustainable might be a little bit of a small word, uh, small word to define what this is, the idea is actually creating the solutions uh, in a very scientific way, in a way that actually other producers can understand, so we can actually share this information with the whole industry, and for the future, we have more specific solutions towards soil microbiology. Um, so just to give a few facts about soil, because as you have noticed, many people came here and talked about soil. Why everyone is talking about soil? Why soil is this hot topic at the moment, not only for the coffee industry, but everything else? First of all, uh, there are many studies that show that we are not going to be able to feed the world uh, by 2050 because the population increased so much and soil is being depleted all over the world. In Australia, uh, for example, is one of the, land, the, the places in the world that loses more soil in the world, 10, uh, 10 million hectares are lost per year. So, that's, sorry, 10,000 hectares are lost per year per year. That's a lot of land. So if you put that in the long term, that could mean a big, big loss. Also at the same time, in the past years, many specialized courses in soil, they were shut down because they, were, they, had not, they hadn't attendance enough to keep going. Actually, now they are starting again because people are starting to talk about this. So we have to go to the extreme so we can actually wake up a little bit. And another thing that is interesting and makes soil a very hot topic is new technological scientific ways that we, can, that we have now, they are more recent and that we didn't have before, that actually allow us to look at soil in a different way that we didn't look before. And what is this? So when you think about soil in a very simple way, soil is three main things. So we have the chemistry, of the physics of the soil, the chemistry of the soil, and the biology of the soil. Uh, those are the three aspects that actually will make these things, that, this thing that we step on and things grow on it. Uh, so when we think about those three things, the soil chemistry through the years, it was very largely studied. So this is the amount of studies in soil chemistry that we have developed throughout the years until today. And when you compare to soil physics, this is the amount that we have developed, amount of knowledge that we have accumulated through the years. And when you think about soil, micro, soil biology, which is the worms that Delmi was mentioning, also the microorganisms, enzymes, nematodes, and many other things, it's this small. So we have very little knowledge, but the reason why we have very little knowledge about this is because it's a much more complicated way to, uh, the, the, the ways that we can actually assess this information is much more complicated. Uh, first thing that makes it complicated is the old paradigms that Delmi was talking about. Uh, when we accumulate lots of knowledge about chemistry of the soil, what we started to do? We developed products, chemical products, that could actually correct and change the chemistry of the soil. So I told you a few minutes ago that in Cerrado we had no coffee because the soil of Cerrado is naturally acidic. Coffee doesn't like it. You have to, to have a certain acidity, which you mentioned, to grow coffee. And when there was a technology of adding limestone, you could actually correct the pH and grow coffee there. So we learned a lot and we have a lot of knowledge in how to play with this chemistry of the soil. We, uh, we can add minerals, we can make the soil more fertile by doing those things. And of course, lots of industries, they have earned lots and lots of money with that. And until a certain point, farmers were seeing that, yeah, if I put this product here, I really double my production. And this is great. And we at the Terra, and I just want to make a parenthesis here, we are not organic, 
We have a little organic plantation at our farms, and I'm not, I'm not defending organic production. I'm not defending regular production. I'm just giving you a timeline of what happened as we accumulated knowledge in terms of the chemical aspect of the soil. And there was lots of investments in that. Because if you think about agriculture, it's one of the industries that generate more, a, a, a huge amount of money in the world. And even for developing countries that are in a very bad situation like Brazil, it's the only thing that keeps the country alive. So lots of money was dedicated for this piece that seemed to be the big solution to grow any kinds of agri-products. Uh, the thing is, another thing that made it complicated is the proportion of the biology of the soil compared to other things. So if you think about the, the mineral part of the soil, if you get a, a handful of soil and we divide all these different things that will make it, uh, mineral and, and the mineral matter is 45% of this handful of soil. Uh, air can be oxygen and other gases that are out there and we're breathing there right now, is 25% of this handful of soil. Water, and of course it varies depending on how moist your soil is, is about 25%. And then this, depending on how much more water you have, less air you have, so they, they exchange in accordance to the moisture of your soil. And then you have this little piece here that is the, orga the organic matter that will also contain the biomass, which are which the live part of the soil. So if you look at this handful of soil and you see that this little piece here is actually the organic matter and even smaller is this, the part that is alive, why caring about those things? It, doesn't, it might not have that much importance as well. It's too small. But uh, it looks small, but if you think, if you get my boot here and you scratch all the dust that you have in it, it's, you're going to have like less than a gram of soil. This already contains more live microorganisms that were living in the soil that I stepped than the amount of stars that we have in this galaxy. So it is very small, but when you think that way from another perspective, you have more things living in this little uh, amount of soil than the stars in this galaxy, which we struggle with the technology that we have today to access. So it is small, but it can make a lot of noise if you know how to treat it well. Uh, so just to give you a, a little perspective in numbers uh, about what, are, what is this living part of the soil? So we have bacteria, fungus, archaea, algae, protozoa, nematodes, arthropods, worms, the little worm that was happy in the end of the presentation <laughs> that they all made today. Yeah, and many other different things. What's that? The sexy worm. Just I'm asking for the names. I don't have the names. <laughs> you can call them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is a universe, literally, uh, of living, organi living organisms that can actually be in this, in this soil. And why is that important? Because those are organisms, they eat, they breathe, they generate substances that, can actual that actually can relate to other microorganisms that actually can relate to our organisms to the organisms of the plant and create effects that we have no idea how powerful they are. Just so you have an idea uh, of how this is possible, if you get two rats, and these are the actually I actual scientific experiments. Two rats, they are twins, they have the same genes, the same DNA and everything, and you get these two rats, laboratory rats, and you get a f another fat rat or the a, a fat person, obese person, you will scratch a little bit the stomach of this person or the saliva or something and you give to one of the rats. And then you get a healthy person, it can be a human being, you will scratch the stomach of this person, get the microorganisms there, there, or even the saliva and you give to the other rat and you wait. What happens? One 
red is going to grow to the sides, and the other one is going to be very healthy. That's how powerful the microorganisms can interact with animal bodies. Same thing happens to the plants. The thing is, it's harder for us to realize that. So nowadays, many, many treatments that are being recommended by doctors, for example, they are actually very much related to creating a more balanced flora of microorganisms in your tummy. Why is that? And it's pretty silly and has been going around forever, but this is uh, something that's very efficient because these microorganisms, they can actually produce substances that cause reactions in your body that will make you want to eat more sweet, for example. Or if you have the right microorganisms, it can make you want to eat more iron because your, your body is lacking of it. So this happens with us. Same thing happens with the coffee plants. That's or any plant. That's why it's important to understand those things. Uh, on top of that, why is it important to understand those, those things? Because soil can be a much bigger solution for many of the problems that we have, not only in agriculture, but in the world, and we have no idea about it. For example, we talk a lot about global warming and uh, how to sequestrate carbon and credits of carbon and things like that. So besides all the nutrition part of the plant, besides uh, all, the, all the water that we can retain the soil because we have other plants like you guys were saying before me, if we have smart ways to, to, to conduct our soil, we can actually sequestrate more carbon. We literally get the carbon that is out there in the atmosphere and we put it back in the soil. Because that's what one of the parts of the soil is formed. So this can be also a very good solution to stop, not to stop, but to mitigate global warming. It's not only good for the plants, it's good for the planet in a bigger picture as well. Uh, so a good soil promotes biological balance, uh, it re regulates the plant growth, it, produ it produces humus, humus that's gonna really keep this, this moisture in the soil, aggregates and structure the soil, re uh, makes water retention, con uh, it conserves the soil as well uh, from erosion and runoff of water, as you were saying. It protects the plants, and that's something that I, I want to, I will explain further. But if you have a healthy soil with healthy microorganisms, the bad microorganisms, the ones that can cause disease and problems, they won't be able to get to the roots of the plants and cause disease. And that will actually, in the long term, make you need less chemical treatments because you have the right microorganisms just working in your plants. Same thing that we we're saying about the healthy, healthy tummy. Um, also, it helps cycling nutrients. What is that? Some nutrients that the plant needs, the plant cannot access by itself. The microorganisms, they have to break those nutrients down and make it available for the plant. So if you don't have the microorganisms that are going to do it, for example, just putting nitrogen, it's not going to be effective if you don't have the microorganisms that actually are going to make this, this nitrogen available for the plant. So I can put like a ton of nitrogen there and nothing's going to happen. Uh, and also it helps mineralization. Same thing. The minerals that compose the soil and are important for the plant. A healthy soil that has lots of life in it will be able to break down those minerals and create this rich soil. But why? Another reason why we were not looking at those things because we had a lot, lots of difficulty and we had no, no effective means to actually get this handful of soil and isolate those bacteria that were there because science would not allow it to us. So, for example, until uh, probably 20 years ago, when we wanted to analyze this handful of soil and see what bacteria are here, what, what is the living part of this soil, how can I see that? You would get this uh, laboratory equipment and you would uh, make a culture 
analysis, which means you put it there with a, with a, in a solution, the soil in a solution, and the bacteria that are in a very small, small scale, they are gonna grow there, right? So they grow there and then you count. Oh, so I have this bacteria here and I have this bacteria here, so this soil has these bacteria. But this methodology was only able to show us less than 1% of the, actually, the actual microorganisms that were living there. Uh, because some microorganisms, they live in symbiosis. So when you take this handful from the soil and you try to isolate the microorganisms in this solution, many of them, they just die. They actually need to be in the soil, in the roots, otherwise they don't live. So this wouldn't give us enough information of what was living there. And this was a big challenge because we had no means to actually access this information. So how could we uh, apply biological techniques, natural techniques in the field and actually evaluate, count if it was working if we had no means to count those microorganisms? We didn't, we didn't know how to do that. More recently, though, uh, and that's where it really gets really sci-fi, <laughs> uh, we, the, the scientists developed new ways to, to assess this information. Now there are some uh, not culture independent methods that are not gonna use those regular uh, growth of my, those cultures of microorganisms. Now we can actually isolate the DNA of the soil, which means regardless if the, the bacteria, they're alive or not, you get this handful of soil and you can see, track all the DNA of any creatures, micro creatures that were living there. So you know exactly what was living there before the agronomical techniques that we are applying now. And then we can keep tracking that over time to see how it developed. Okay, so those are molecular techniques that can assess these microbial communities. So that's how it's done now. What is the downside of it? Uh, the downside of it is that it's very expensive. Not many labs around the world, they have access to this kind of technology, especially when you think of producing countries. So we can create some techniques and apply them to the field. And in a very empirical way, until this moment, that's what we have been doing. In a very empirical way, you say, oh, I use this a uh, natural fertilizer and it looks like the tree is he healthier and producing more and happier. But what actually happened there? Is that the right formula? Can we do something different? Can we adjust this here? We could not do that until now. Um, so again, this is very expensive. There are very few universities in the world and labs in the world that can actually do this kind of DNA tracing. So. One of our challenges in the Biotech Academy is to, to produce research and produce studies with this scientific basis in a way that we can actually explain what's happening to our team and to other producers as well. So we create techniques that are really effective and not, not only something that we say, oh, that's what we believe in, that's what we really tested and you know that's gonna work, regardless of where you are uh, and what techniques you want to, to apply. So, just to understand a little bit of what I, I said before, how these microorganisms, they will uh, interact under the soil with the plant and cause different effects. So what happens is, in the rhizosphere, which is the root system of the, the plant, you have this microbiome. So you have the good microorganisms, as I was saying, that will uh, help the metabolism of the plant, will make the, 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 the plant more resistant to stress, to grow and develop, to acquire these nutrients that are in the soil but the, the tree cannot absorb by itself, to protect the trees against some other pathogens, and also to help the tree's uh, immune response. So you have those. But 
you have also the bad ones that will cause disease in the plant. Same thing as us. There are some microorganisms that will make great to our bodies. And others, they are going to cause a stomachache or worse. Um, and you have the ones that are the, the ugly, which will cause contamination pretty much. So they're not as bad as the bad, but still you don't want them very much. The truth is what we have trying to be doing with everything in our lives is just to get rid of this part. So, okay, I have a pest in my field. So let's spray, let's, uh, let's kill all the insects that are killing our crops. The truth is you need balance. So you need those guys to exist, because in a way they are interacting with these guys as well and allowing them to exist. And this happens with everything in our lives. So the secret is, how can we implement treatments that will allow all this community to exist in a way that these guys are not going to kill the plant because they are happy and they are over there living, and while these ones here are up, running, and doing what they need to do with the plant in a way that the plant looks healthier. Um, so this is a picture that shows pretty much how it, it works. So we have, a, we have two different uh, structures here of soil. So we have this one with bigger biodiversity, and we have this one with smaller biodiversity. So what does that mean? So you see these guys here, those are the bad ones. And they want the plant as well, because the plant offers food for them. The plant will, uh, will release some substances in the soil. They have the sugars and different things that the chemical substances that the, the microorganisms will need to survive. They have to feed as well. And both the good guys and the bad guys, they want it. All of them, they want a piece of the plant. They want to get to the rhizosphere and eat and survive. The thing is, if you have a very, very, very biodiverse soil, they do like a, a barrier. They have to compete with the good ones. And how can we create that? By diversifying the ecosystem that we have in the plantations. So what we have been studying a lot at the farm and many people are doing this at the moment, is how can we create a more diverse system in our fields in a way that we create also a more, a more biodiverse microbiological system. So how does that happen? So imagine that you have, and this is, we have done that, okay? So in the terra, because this was how 30 years ago when we started, this was what our agronomists would learn in school. So you, need a, you are doing a coffee plantation. What do you do? You plant the coffee trees, and it's good not to have grass in the, in the, in the soil because it just creates some problems in management as, uh, that will not be good for, for your logistics. So what we do, you would just try to remove all the grass and all the wild vegetation, things like that. This was what agronomists, they were taught for many, many years. Uh, and especially you would use some products just to kill the plants so you don't have to mow it, it's more, it's more work. You just put some herbicide and it works well. But what happens is, first of all, you kill all the microorganisms that are living there. And second of all, and this for Brazil is a big challenge because we are a monoculture kind of country. We have these big fields of coffee plants. So when you think about all those microorganisms in this picture, they all want to feed. There was a forest there before with different plants, with different roots, with different flavors. So each microorganism would tend to choose the ones they liked the most. But then someone many, many years ago took away this forest and planted coffee there. So all these microorganisms, they still have to live and to feed and they need, they need to be there. What are they gonna eat? Coffee, because that's the only thing that's available there. When you create a system like this, each of them, it's like a banquet. They can actually choose what works better for them. And some, you can, you can, you can actually plant some trees in the mid rows, some plants that will 
attract specific microorganisms that you don't want in the cough trees. Or you can even plant some that they're not gonna like and they're gonna go away. So there are different techniques that you can use. So uh, this whole system becomes a more balanced system. You are not killing the nematodes, for example. You are not killing uh, the bad or the ugly guys. You are just giving them food. And if they like where they're living, they don't have to go to the coffee plants. That's how you create a, a more balanced ecosystem. And that's the biggest challenge. And that's what we're trying to, to, to improve at the moment as our biggest challenge. Uh, because even though we, we do think that we have done a lot in the last 30 years, that's our biggest challenge at the moment. We got awarded as the most sustainable farm, but we don't believe we are that. We believe we have to be better. We always have to be better. We, we, we believe we, we do a lot, but we can always do more. And then you set the bar that was here, here, and you create impact in the market. And we want to impact Brazil more to grow coffee more naturally as well. So that's the next step, and you keep improving all the time. And this is a big challenge because, as I said, Brazil is a monoculture. You have big fields of coffee. Uh, it, it's mechanized. It's just complicated to, to put other trees in the middle. It's complicated to do shade ground. It's complicated to just plant coffee in the forest. It's a different system. So we are trying to create those solutions in a way that it works for Brazil and that we can actually share and make this impact the whole country. What is that? So you were talking about a few techniques, so I will not extend, also because it can go too much in detail. One of the techniques is uh, planting cover crops uh, in the mid rows that will bring new, new dishes to this banquet that the microorganisms they can feed off. Uh, and we are trying to create some techniques combining different summer crops and winter crops so we can actually be uh, rotating those. Because coffee, it's a culture that we don't rotate. It's the trees, they just stay there. We cannot do it like, like soybeans, that they plant soybeans, they remove the soybeans and they plant rice and they plant wheat. So you rotate the culture you are producing. You cannot do that with coffee. The trees are going to be there. So in the mid rows, we can rotate. That's going to be much more labor. That's much more work. But at the same time, it creates this more balanced ecosystem. So in the summer, use the crotalaria, for example, uh, which is also a leguminous tree that helps fixing and bringing nitrogen to the soil, which is great for the coffee plants. So you can reduce the need of chemical application of nitrogen. Uh, it stays. In the summer, in the, in the field, we mow it, and this becomes uh, a coverage for the soil that's going to retain more water and also becomes uh, organic matter that's, that's also going to give back some nutrients to the soil. Cajanus uh, cajan, I brought the scientific names of those plants because they have very funny Brazilian names that probably don't translate literally in English. <laughs> uh, was that? For example. Yeah, so the Cajanus Cajan is another one also for summer crops. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the regular area. So everything that we are doing, we are trying to combine different uh, cover crops in the summer and in the winter. And we are actually, and that's the difference, because we have, we are consulting with many people that have been doing that. But the thing is, nobody has the scientific aspect what microorganisms are develop, developing when I plant Cajanus Cajan? And what microorganisms don't like it? What microorganisms are developing when I put the Crotillaria? This one here. So this is the kind of information that you can read many different scientific papers and you will not find it. And what is the right combination for winter and summer? And what impact it causes in the field? So this is the main focus of the research. And now, again, we have the means to do that. We have the te technology that can actually trace the DNA of the soil and tell us exactly what is happening at the soil 
in the microbiological level. So uh, I was just showing this one, Avenis trigosa, this is for winter. And Vicha Craca is also for winter. And we are combining with other ones that I, I just brought a few of them for you. Those plants, they are planted in the mid rows. Uh, after, depends on the areas, five months, six months, we mow it and we incorporate this. There's another it's message again. here. It's gone again. It's gone again. Okay, yeah. Uh, and it actually looks pretty as well because you have lots, all these flowers in the mid rows of the coffee plants. This is another one also for winter. And in the end, we can mix and match and see what we are getting as a result. This is, this, this is gonna be the third year that we are doing this. We expect to have more solid results from the fourth year onwards. Because anything that you do in the agronomical aspect of things, especially when we talk about coffee plants, they take some time to, to adapt to this model and also to replicate some behavior. So you really have to analyze for many, many years. You were talking earlier today about developing new genetics material, which takes 30 years. So having some results here in four is actually quite short. We are uh, uh, quite uh, lucky here. What are the, the results that we are getting so far? Uh, we have been analyzing these different treatments, not only from the agronomical perspective, but being from a specialty industry, we also want to understand how that impacts the flavor profile. Is any of those things really impacting the quality, the final quality of the coffee? In these first two years, we have been cupping these coffees, the regular areas with no treatments, and the areas with the different treatments. And so far, uh, the, the cupping profile is stabilized. Let's see how it goes in the future. In terms of uh, the combinations to generate more diversity, by their microbiological diversity in the soil, there are a few treatments of winter crossed with summer intercrops that are looking better at the moment, which are the Cajanos Cajan with uh, a Venice Rigosa. So that seems to be what works for us. And what we want to do is, how can we actually test the same techniques that we see that we wor they work in different areas so we can actually create uh, recipes that we work for other producers as well. Because what we feel is that this is the kind of research and study that is not important only for the Terra. We have accumulated a lot of knowledge through the years uh, and we, we feel that the Terra being a big farm has a responsibility to actually cause some positive impact in the world. So I was saying in the beginning that I think that telling that those, those techniques, they are related to sustainability is actually quite small because sustainability for us is more about not damaging things. So how can you save water? How can you uh, pollute less? How can you prevent from killing animals and to destroy forests? So how can you preserve, protect things? And that's very important. But we believe that right now, uh, we should create a different kind of sustainability. That besides protecting things, we have to give back. So how can we give back to those lands that have been installed for 20 plus years? How can we give back to those lands and regenerate the soil? It's not only taking care of the soil and avoiding problems, it's regenerating it. How can we, it's not only about uh, not polluting the rivers, how can we actually try to recycle water and put it back into the system in ways that you don't have to take extra water. It's not uh, only about not polluting the air. How can you actually create systems that are gonna sequestrate the carbon that is already in the atmosphere and put it back into the soil? So this is causing positive impact. Uh, an impact that respects bio, but also are smart. They are solutions that we have to start thinking uh, because we have, a, we have taken from the land for too long, and now we have to create those solutions, those smart solutions. We are calling this a bio-smart concept, bio-smart agriculture. And I like that you use water smart in your presentation because it's exactly the same thing. 
just taking care of the water and not polluting is too little right now. We have to create these smarter solutions that really cause positive impact. And one of our positive impacts is that Terra has uh, already is already a big farm. We, we struggled a lot to get there, but now being a big farm, we have a big responsibility with sharing this. We cannot develop this kind of study and keep it to ourselves because this is important for the world. Uh, so all of these studies and all of those researches, they'll be posted online and any producers in the world, and we actually ask each of you here to, when we have the results, we don't have it still, to help us sharing all of that. And we are looking for partners to test those techniques in different places. So I would love to, over some drinks, discuss <laughs> with Delmi and with you guys as well, Wendell. Yeah, and Raul, about how we can test that in Honduras and other places and really create formulas for a more natural agriculture that doesn't work only for Brazil, but for other places. And we have a very practical experience that with this scientific approach might lead us to the right way. So I think that's the full circle, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, but, but seriously, uh, coffee industry is great because it allows this kind of interaction that we don't see as much in other industries. So this is what we have been doing as one of our main ch challenges at the moment. <coughs> Santiago asked me later, is it true that the terra is going to become organic in, in 2030? <laughs> and I said, why are you saying that? <laughs> Where did you get that from? And I, I told him that, no, we don't, we, I cannot answer that. Our objective with this is not becoming organic. Our objective with this is creating an agriculture that makes more sense for the challenges we're going to have in the future. Yes, there is a lot of organic going on, and I actually am a consumer of organic myself, so I'm not, please don't take it wrong. Uh, if you think about Denmark, for example, they have a specific commitment from the government to turn the whole country into organic until 2020. This is going to start reverberating in other places. Was that? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so maybe people are going to be looking for organic more and more in the future. But regardless of that, maybe in the end of this study, what we realize is that we don't have to be organic. If the plant is sick, maybe we can go there and apply something. Because I'm not a person that likes medicines, but when my head is aching too much, I take an aspirin. So this, our objective here is not to become organic. It's become f more fair with the environment where we are uh, and actually to give back to the, to the lands, to restore the lands where we are and to share that with everyone else. If that becomes, that comes to being organic in the future, this might happen, but that's not our goal. We just believe that we should take the next step to sustainability. And we are looking for partners. <laughs>